And in its response, the White House saying the U.S. is pleased to have learned about the successful Israeli military operation to rescue two hostages being held by Hamas terrorists in Rafah. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby saying President Joe Biden will continue working to secure the release of the remaining 134 hostages. He also noted reports that dozens of Palestinian civilians were killed in IDF bombings that took place during the operation. So now, for more insight, it's a pleasure to welcome to studio international affairs analyst Dan Perry, former Europe and Middle East editor at the Associated Press and former chairman of the Foreign Press Association in Jerusalem and our senior diplomatic correspondent, Owen Alterman. Gentlemen, thank you both so much for being here. So I need to start with this moment, the special moment for Israelis when two hostages... Before it starts to fade away, let's stay with it. This moment is so important. People waking up to the news that two of the hostages rescued in this precise, risky, highly dangerous operation, retrieving these two men who had no idea the operation was going to be happening and bringing them safely home. I personally can watch the videos of them being reunited with their family members all day. Your thoughts? Well, it's obviously, as, as uh, uh, has been said, a, a good news day in that regard. Uh, look, uh, scarcity has value, and good news has been scarce in Israel of late. So I think it is, it, it, it was heartwarming and wonderful to behold, not just for the families, for the entire country, really. But uh, alongside the things we can celebrate, for example, that apparently the idea of had intel in this case, and that's that's great. Uh, I, I'm not so sure that this is a model that moves the needle in a bigger picture. Most of the hostages, I think we believe, are held in tunnels, and it wouldn't have worked. I don't know why uh, these brothers-in-law were held in an apartment, uh, nor who gave them away. Uh, I'd, would that it were so, that this could be replicated times 60, five, uh, but, but it seems unlikely. So it's good news, but the basic foundational dilemma remains that Israel can't remove Hamas from Gaza without invading Rafah, and there are legitimate concerns that invading Rafah fully, not with commandos and a pinpoint mission, but even so, it looks like killed dozens of people. Uh, an, uh, an, uh, an offensive against Rafah could be a bloodbath, and, and Israel, as I'm sure we'll talk about later on in the show, is running out of rope in that regard. Your thoughts on exactly that, that moment right now, it's been a long wait for the families. It's been a long wait for the nation to get some smidgen of good news. And certainly to get these two men home means the world for the nation and the morale in the country right now. Absolutely. No question about it. And holds out, although everything Dan said is absolutely right, that maybe just maybe holds out the prospect of more rescues with more intel being collected, more intelligence being collected day in, day out. And again, as was explained in an earlier broadcast, Benita, you know, it, it's almost like a, in, in a sense, like a COVID graph, right? Where in that pandemic, one person would infect multiple people, infect multiple, and we saw the graphs shoot up exponentially. There may be a, a, dy a similar dynamic with intelligence, that one piece of intelligence leads to two or three others, which lead to two or three others, and so on and so forth so you can much more rapidly climb the tree if you will or climb the staircase of intelligence and be able to maybe execute it although of course what dan said is is very much true that that may have limitations and for the time being it is two hostages who have been freed we're seeing again some of those pictures on our screens but obviously many many more who are still in captivity and therefore when you talk about the dynamics of a potential hostage deal negotiation and the wider picture of the war of course this doesn't really make a dent. And yes, the, the specific complexities of Rafa obviously are going to very much be weighing on the government's decision making. Although, and I think Dan said this as well, there certainly is a strong internal logic for having an operation in Rafa, for achieving the goals of the war, of ending Hamas control over the, over the Gaza Strip. And Hamas control over the Gaza Strip can't be achieved while Hamas is in control of Rafah, nor can the real degrading and ending Hamas's ability to operate as a military organization be achieved if, as we're told by the Israeli government, there are four battalions who are still, that are still active in Rafah and presumably can't really meaningfully be dismantled short of some uh, more substantial operation. Although there has to be, the humanitarian issue has to be taken very seriously and there has to be a plan that, that's realistic and that can be implemented. You know, I have to, I find myself wondering because something has to give. It's clearly a, such an excruciating situation and it is a humanitarian disaster. I wonder whether uh, the powers that be might end up considering 
leaving Hamas in power in Rafah only, with the degradation at the degree that which it is, uh, and and hope that the density of the population there and the anger of the population there, which is com which is mostly displaced persons from northern Gaza and central Gaza, maybe that will finally create a new dynamic that Israel's been hoping for for 16, 17 years, which involves a rebellion against uh, Hamas that is effective or a split in Hamas uh, with maybe some of them being more agreeable to uh, uh, to some version of a, of, of a surrender. Now, I'm in no way predicting this, but we are looking, at, nor even uh, recommending it, but, but there are, there's a limited menu of options here. And there's not, not a lot of great options. I think you will agree with that as well. Of course. And that's an optimistic scenario yeah. you're laying out and raises the possibility that Hamas left in power in Rafah with some other regime in control of the rest of the Strip raises its own questions of how that could possibly be workable and administered. So, again, no easy solutions here. Uh, but obviously that... There is an internal logic for moving forward. I, I suppose some kind of if operation. the rest of Gaza were really cleared of Hamas, you'd start letting the displaced people back, and you'd end up having them be isolated in a very, very tiny area where you can perhaps smoke them out. I don't know, but creative solutions are going to be necessary. You can't eliminate the Hamas threat if they still exist and are in power in Rafa. Like I say, uh, we're not looking at great choices. If it turns out that Israel's rope has run out today. The uh, European Union's foreign minister advised, effectively advised, indirectly, hesitantly, maybe somewhat jokingly, I don't know, but he was talking about an arms embargo against Israel. Uh, Israel cannot continue this war for long if the U.S. puts the squeeze that way. If it turns out that the world concludes in the Biden administration, partly compelled perhaps by U.S. politics, because this, this has become a domestic issue in the U.S. that risks returning Trump to power because it has divided the various constituencies that form the democratic uh, coalition that keeps Biden afloat, if it turns out they've really run out of patience and they've concluded that too many people have been killed and enough is enough, then Israel has difficult choices to make. And, uh, you know, I too want a world that is perfect where I uh, achieve all my ends. And I hope Israel achieves all its ends in this war. Uh, but, but I said from the beginning in the studio, October 7th was such, such a global historic pogrom and outrage that even the government of Israel despised in almost every country around the world was given rope. It was given rope, it was given a line of credit. But I said so then, I believe on October 10th or 11th. The line of credit is not without limit, and we're seeing what it looks like when a limit approaches. Israelis can't be in a situation where what happened on the 7th of October could happen again, whether it is out of the threat in the Gaza Strip or no. in the West Bank or up across the northern They may front. want to defend the border and not have 90% of the standing army in the West Bank dealing with self-inflicted uh, chaos in that arena. I want to bring an update that is coming through as we're speaking that an Israeli delegation is now reportedly going to be heading to Cairo. Now, that was up in the air until just moments ago, so I'm going to come straight to you on that, Owen. And what that means right now, we obviously are waiting to see some kind of progress coming out of some kind of hostage deal. That certainly would be music to the ears of many right now. What do you make of Israel sending through a delegation at this juncture? I, I think the real question, again, Benita, is, is Hamas going to be showing some flexibility? Because if Hamas is going to be saying that in order to get the hostages back, Israel needs to essentially end the war, it's going to be a non-starter here. And you're right, on one hand, there will be people who are going to be very happy and maybe relieved that at least there's a sign that the talks are moving forward. But there's a part of the Israeli public that's going to be scared, that's going to be worried about this, that's not going to be happy. And we've been hearing from that segment. Now, again, so much of judging a deal, it will depend on the terms of the deal. And we don't have those yet may, because may. we're not into a real negotiation yet because Hamas hasn't put something on the table that Israel, if the Israeli public, broadly speaking, could plausibly accept. Uh, but once, if and when that happens, then then sure, the debate will be on. And in the meantime, in the meantime, uh, the Israeli military is, is in government, at least is talking about focusing on the first goal, right? The goal, as I've always said, of winning the war proper, so to speak, right? Ending Hamas control over the Strip, stopping Hamas's ability to function as a military, and again, going back to the operation in Rafah. Uh, there's a narrative, though, that's uh, starting to gr take hold in Israel that says that to do that, to achieve total victory, as Netanyahu calls it, amounts to, in one way or another, sacrificing most of the hostages, because uh, it just won't happen quickly enough. Now, 
You know, there are a few more surefire signs of lack of wisdom than making predictions in such a situation, so I won't. But uh, I, I, I will just throw another idea out on the table. What is preventing a hostage deal is uh, the idea that it has to be all the hostages. Uh, and therefore, for in, in exchange for that, uh, Hamas demands an end to the war. And I've never expected them to do any different, because otherwise, Sinwar continues the war one month later, two months later, this time, shorn. Of his human of his human shields. Now he 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 may be maniacal, but he probably is not stupid enough to agree to that. Um, therefore, the possibility would be a partial hostage release in exchange for, let's say, a temporary a ceasefire during Ramadan, which begins next month. And and for the, and that means a little bit of the heat is off Israel. Uh, they can have the Ramadan with humanitarian supplies coming in. Uh, and uh, and, and, and see, plan in Rafa could and start to be implemented. Indeed, indeed. Uh, Biden can can maybe start campaigning for real, not just worrying about Netanyahu. Uh, and uh, and, and Sinwar will keep some human shields. It's, it's obviously horribly tragic. But Israel will see how delighted everyone is over two hostages returning. Wouldn't it be convivial to have 40? Uh, I, I, I don't see Hamas agreeing to uh, returning all of them unless there is a total end to the ceasefire to which I don't see Israel agreeing. David Barnea, Mossad chief, is going to be heading that delegation according to these latest reports just coming through right now, going to Cairo tomorrow to continue with those talks. As we well know, no concrete outcome. At this juncture, we wait to see what will come out of those discussions in the Egyptian capital. Joe Biden has told Benjamin Netanyahu, don't press into Rafa without a credible plan for civilians. Your thoughts right now, Dan, on the U.S. pressure from the president right now. We will put aside the concerns around his abilities at this juncture and just ask about the pressure that he is putting on Israel right now. I predicted earlier that we'd get to this and it proved to not be unwise. Yeah, Biden needs the war to end. He, this can't continue. Um, uh, from his perspective, for the reasons that we know, if uh, with every day that passes, more and more youthful progressives say they're going to not only not vote for him, but are going to vote for Trump, which is insane. Uh, and on the other hand, as he turns against Israel, Jews are starting to talk about, you know, also abandoning the Democrats. Remember, Biden won in 2020, more or less, by 80,000 votes, no more, in about four critical states that flipped. He can't lose any votes. And... This attaches to an issue that, if this can be believed, might even be bigger than Gaza and Israel and the Palestinians in the Middle East, which is what the world will look like if Trump returns to power. Remember, they're talking about leaving NATO, for real. I mean, good Lord. Uh, therefore, as I said before uh, earlier today, I believe Israel's running out of rope real quick and creative thinking is necessary. Now, if Israel had a government that would say yes but to the various uh, uh, propos proposals. Yes, we'll agree to the PA returning the, to, to civilian control in Gaza because we know we have no better options, but we have conditions. Yes, we'll give basically lip service to a Palestinian state because no one knows what's going to happen later on, uh, but demilitarized. And of course, we're happy to collect normalization with Saudi Arabia in the bargain. And we give the Palestinians in the world some vision of a day after that is not eternal Israeli uh, uh, occupation, and that isn't just constant negativity with a lot of suspicion uh, thrown into the mix that this is basically an election campaign by Netanyahu and that in any case he has a political interest in prolonging the war. Under these circumstances, Israel is running out of rope with dizzying speed. Now, a different leadership or this leadership wising up and doing what I believe any responsible leadership would do, which is to engage uh, with what looks like a pretty attractive menu of, uh, of goodies that is being put on the table for Israel in exchange for very little, in fact, and indeed uh, a, a, a way out. That would create pressure on Hamas to indeed surrender, but by the Arabs. I mean, it would be their plan that has been essentially, by, in, to a degree, adopted by Israel. But instead, an Israel that only knows how to say no, and it already has caused the deaths, we think, of around 20,000 civilians. We don't know that. We don't know for sure. And the Israeli but estimates are lower than that. How much lower are they? 12,000 Hamas uh, fighters killed, so do the math, about 15,000. Well... So, really? Well, let's unpack a little bit more of exactly that. Uh, I think that, that is real. difference running. in ratio. It's a significant difference in ratio. I have also read John Spencer from West Point telling you how it's a, it's a very fine ratio. But the world, after f almost five months of this, has run out of patience for the explanations. 
Well, listen, I'm going to say a couple things. First of all, in terms of the day after the normalization package, I think the Israeli government will get there for reasons I've said in studio that track with yours, right? You're essentially pocketing the normalization. You're making a prediction. Make, well, okay. <laughs> You're pocketing the normalization and making a, a rhetorical commitment to a Palestinian state to which you can attach caveats. That split second, Bibi that loses his coalition. Such that that doesn't actually come to fruition. But there are things, yeah. I think, for Netanyahu, getting the normalization that, that are maybe even bigger than the coalition, possibly, and he can figure out the politics. The extreme right will leave. As for, as for the war in Gaza, and as you put it, diplomatic rope, or you can use the, the metaphor of the diplomatic hourglass, the issues there are different. There are issues of civilian casualties in the humanitarian situation, less so the day after itself. And there, again, let's go back to what the Biden administration is saying. They're saying, we are not vetoing an operation in Rafah. We understand the logic. We need the humanitarian issue to be taken seriously because there are so many people there in such difficult conditions. And the concept of moving so many people who are already in such difficult conditions to someplace else, where are they going to get their housing, their food, their medical care, etc.? Well, we're still at least maybe coming out of it, but still in the middle of the winter, right? That there needs to be a real plan, and there needs to be planning. It needs to be taken seriously, and it's going yeah. to take time to implement that. I, I think if the government were to take that challenge seriously, and it's Israel's own interest to do this. It's Israel's own interest to do this for, for legal reasons, for practical reasons. No, no doubt about For it. the military to be able to actually achieve the objectives. We are the, saying the, the, the same needs, thing. Right. This plan needs to be implemented, yeah. right? But I, I still think that the day after a normalization issue and, and this humanitarian civilian issue are to some degree separate here. And I don't think that the diplomatic rope or the hourglass will have entirely, it, 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 you know, ecli- been have entirely run out. As yeah. long as that plan can be put on the table and Israel can be seen as being acting in goodwill to implement I it. I said it's running out, and I added it's running out with dizzying speed. And it's all the factors you mentioned. What the coefficient is for each factor can be discussed. It's a humanitarian situation, civilian casualties, and the uh, complete negativity about uh, U.S. proposals, reasonable proposals for a day after, despite what looks like Israel's clear interest in playing nice to get normal, no, normalization with Saudi Arabia and maybe other Arab countries, which is a vast improvement of its strategic situation. More than this, it aligns Saudi Arabia with Israel's in terms of the interest of resolving Gaza. And they've already made clear that if Israel agrees in principle to Palestinian dependence, demilitarize and under different borders at some point in the future, they will uh, uh, assist in the reconstruction of Gaza and they'll take partial, partial responsibility for the situation there. It's in Israel's interest to make this a lot of people's problem and not just Israel's problem. Even if full normalization, according to the most recent Saudi statement, would have to wait until the to the coming into being of the, the Palestinian state and all the 1960 borders, for what it's worth, that's they what they They walked it back a little. By the way, it's it's probably also true that uh, their, uh, the nuances behind their statements change with uh, the political winds, and at this point, with the credibility of the Israeli government. A different Israeli government might be able to get something different from the Saudis. Benjamin Netanyahu has said the U.S. response to the 7th of October would be at least as strong as Israel's. What do you, Dan, think the U.S. response would be if terrorists had come in, butchered people, tortured people, abducted people, held them captive, for time frames like this, what do you think the response would be out of Washington? I think this may be the truest thing that Netanyahu has ever stated in his entire history as a politician. But the thing is this, if that had happened, the U.S. would not be depending on Israeli arms supply and an Israeli umbrella at the U.N. Security Council. It doesn't change the fact, however, that this can't end until Israelis feel safe again. Uh, well, think about what I said. The U.S. in its current context would indeed behave as Israel does. Israel is ignoring its own context. And the result of doing such a thing in life, not just if you're a country, is that you end up arguing with everyone and eventually possibly being kicked in the teeth. We certainly are going to have to wait to see how this all unfolds.